Praise God for that. Good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to be in Matthew today, so we're not going to be in Exodus. And because we're in Matthew, I apologize, we will not have any children's sermon notes for uh, them to follow along, but I guess you're just going to have to listen to me today. Matthew chapter 5. So turn in your Bibles there to Matthew chapter 5. I might be having some trouble with the connection. I don't know why. So, thanks. Today we're going to be talking about joyful Christians. What does it look like to be a joyful, happy Christian, follower of Christ? So in Matthew chapter 5, we have what starts, what is called the Sermon on the Mount. And this is the greatest sermon ever preached, because the one preaching it is Jesus. So he preaches a sermon that stretches from Matthew 5 all the way to Matthew chapter 7. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. There is so much depth and and riches in this sermon. If you have the time, you should read it over maybe today after church, 5 through 7. But what we're going to take a look at is just the introduction to this sermon. Okay, And that's the first 12 verses. The introduction to what Jesus is going to do. So he goes up on a mountain. He takes crowds there. He takes his disciples there. And he begins to preach. Um, And so we have this section, it's probably labeled in your Bibles, called the Beatitudes. And so these Beatitudes is what Jesus is describing to us, what it looks like to be a blessed, joy-filled, happy Christian. And so we're going to take a look. We're just going to go through them one at a time. And I'm using the word happy, although in our English it doesn't really carry all the nuance and weight that it should in the Greek, which remember the, the New Testament is originally written in the Greek language, there's the word makori, makoriori, I think I said that right, makoriori, and that is the word for blessed here, but it also means happy or fortunate. Um, and so I'm taking that because usually when we have happiness, when we experience happiness, there's some sort of delight or pleasure that we take in whatever we're finding happiness in. So I want to carry that definition with us in, um, and then also use blessed and fortunate, which most of our translations are going to translate it blessed here, and take that in with us to really describe what it means to to do these things and to look like a a joy-filled, happy, blessed, fortunate Christian. And so just to set up the gravity and the weight of these blessings here, uh, R.C. Sproul, who's a famous pastor, he says that if God pronounces a woe, then there is no greater judgment. So I want to take that same logic with us. If God pronounces a blessing, then there's no greater joy. So we look at these with that weight carried in and that gravity carried in with us. So as we move along, we'll see each blessing requires the other. They kind of stack on top of one another. They're all necessities of the Christian life. And each blessing is paired with a reward. Um, So let me read this. I want you guys to follow along. Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So these Beatitudes here point us, again, what it looks like to be a seriously joy-filled follower of Christ. And that's a little tough because as we look at these, half of them seem like they're in the negative. Half of them seem like, well, how can I be happy if I'm mourning? How can I be filled with joy if I'm mourning? Or how can I be filled with joy if I'm being persecuted How can I be filled with joy if I'm poor in spirit? So we look at a lot of these and you're thinking, well, that doesn't sound like it's a description of what a joyous Christian looks like. 
Martin Lloyd-Jones, who's a famous preacher from England, he says that if we look at this list of beatitudes here, this list of blessings, and we don't desire these things, then we may not be a Christian. So take that in with us as we look at these so that we can find the truth and find what Jesus is really getting at, the heart of what he's getting at here in these beatitudes. So we'll take them one by one. The first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Here is something that is massively important for us as Christians to understand and recognize. Recognizing our spiritual poverty is a blessing. In fact, it's the only way that you inherit the kingdom of heaven, is what it says here. Recognizing our spiritual poverty is, in fact, a blessing. And what it means by this is being poor in spirit is really a posture of unworthiness before your Creator. Being poor in spirit is, is, being, is recognizing an unworthiness before God. A brokenness over our sinfulness. When all the world says, you know, this is contrary, because all the world says to build yourself up, be somebody. Be your own person. Build yourself up. You'll get there if you work hard enough. Christ says, recognize your state apart from me. Be poor in spirit. Isaiah 66, 2. It's on the slides there, Kevin. says, all these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. This is what God calls us to be, poor in spirit, although it seems in our heads like that's not a good thing. Spiritual poverty is just like physical poverty. And so the blessing is lying in, in this spiritual poverty, the blessing is lying in the fact that when we are poor in spirit, that is when we are in need of our Savior. So that's the blessing. Because of your sin, You can recognize your need for your Savior who pursues you and who draws you to himself. I don't have to be the one that's in control. I don't have to be rich in spirit because most of the time I'm not going to be. But when I recognize my spiritual poverty apart from Christ, then I see more clearly who it is I actually need. And it's not myself. It's not yourself. It's not anybody on this earth. It's Christ himself. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And I love this one. This is probably my favorite one. Again, another crazy one to think about associating with a blessing, though. Mourning is typically an endeavor that evokes in our hearts a hopelessness. I mean, apart from our faith, what hope and what comfort do we have? Apart from Christ, we have no hope and no comfort. But the genesis of our mourning, the beginning of our mourning, is a mourning over sin and disobedience against a holy God who punishes sin. So just as the first beatitude recognizes our spiritual poverty, so does this beatitude recognize a spiritual mourning over sin. So we're called literally here, Jesus is saying with his own words, be sorrowful over your disobedience, be sorrowful over your sin. And it's in that sorrow, and it's through that mourning, and through the remorse round our sin that we hear words such as these. John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death to life. And the next verse, Romans 5 there, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So as we mourn, we can look back on truths such as those. And our mourning places us into the arms of our Savior who comforts us. Sin should always cause us to be sorrowful. Sin should always cause us to be remorseful. But listen, church, don't exhaust your tears on it. For there is joy and comfort in Christ who provides us with an everlasting salvation. What a blessing. So we mourn just to be comforted by Christ. That's the blessing in this. So as we look at the first two, you can see how they really can be blessings, how you really can be a joy-filled Christian by being poor in spirit and by mourning. So blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
This characteristic, I think, is especially tough for men in our culture, uh, but it's tough for all of us being meek, because if you're meek, if you're gentle, if you're humble, in this world, it is almost set up as a weakness, which is not true. The manliest man I have ever known said these words about himself, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus Christ, the King of the universe, says this about himself. And I, gentle is the same word as meek here. It's the same Greek word. Um, so it's the same description. And he says, I am gentle and I am lowly in my heart. The core of who you are is who your heart is, what, what your heart is. And he says, that's what I am at the core of my being. I am gentle. I am lowly. See, in society and culture, we are bombarded with people in the workplace or at school or whatever, friends and family, that through a prideful, selfish, brutal lifestyle, we can gain and acquire happiness and fulfillment and status and power and possessions. This kind of look out for yourself only mentality, go and take it type, type mindset, is, this is what we've been bombarded with saying, this is how you make it, this is how you find fulfillment, this is how you become powerful. Yet through the words of Jesus here, it will be the meek that inherit the earth. So blessed are the meek. The rough and tough lifestyle may get you at most to be a millionaire, which happiness is temporary, very temporary. But the meek, the gentle, the lowly, they will inherit the earth, which is an eternal blessing from Christ. Romans 4.13, up on the screen here. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring, that's us as Christians, the offspring of Abraham, that he would be the heir of the world. We inherit the earth because of our salvation in Christ. I mean, that's crazy. Enemies, sinners, get to inherit all that God has made. And he's placed us over that. And he says, be meek, Christian. Be meek, be humble before your creator. Recognize your need of him through mourning and spiritual poverty. And that should cause you to be humble before him, knowing that it is he that is powerful, it is he that is creator, and we are creature. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Second favorite, probably. Spiritual poverty causes us mourning over our sin. The rewards for these are the kingdom of heaven and comfort. Only our Savior can give us humility and gentleness patterned after Jesus himself for the inheritance of the earth, which was the promise for those that are saved. And so then we are supposed to, after that, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And righteousness is this idea of seeking after holiness or or being morally in the right. And Jesus draws our attention here Remember, these are his words that he's saying. He's drawing our attention to hunger, hungering and thirsting after this. Being hungry and thirsty causes us to be desired to be filled with food and drink, right? You, you probably have felt what it, some of you are probably feeling it right now, what it's like to be hungry or thirsty in need of food and drink, right? Sorry, you have to wait another three hours when I'm done with this sermon. Just kidding. It's a joke. But basically what we're seeing here in this text, and what we'll continue to see is that we are already filled up with not the right things. So we basically need to be emptied and then filled with the right things. And so one of those things he's pointing to here is hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And we as Christians, we seek after righteousness. But as we do that, what we really are seeking, I think, and what we're really hungering and thirsting for is the righteous one. Jesus himself says this, again, John 6, 35 here. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me, Jesus himself beckoning us to him. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. John 7, 37, a chapter later, he says, He's, on, he's at the last day of this, this certain Jewish feast, and he says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Jesus is promising to be a fulfillment, a satisfaction that only he can provide. So this joyful Christian is the one that seeks after righteousness, seeks to become more like Christ, 
seeks after the righteous one himself because only then, only then, will he be satisfied. And that's what we're looking at a lot of the time in this world, right? It's sad because some people actually think, and we can slip into the mindset of actually thinking that worldly possessions can bring satisfaction. And that's not true. I mean, we know it, but when we get that new thing, that new iPhone, or we get that new promotion at work, whatever it may be, we think for, for the time being, yeah, this is satisfying. This is fulfilling. Only to be let down weeks later, minutes later sometimes. How sad would it be to believe that what satisfies and what fills me and what gives me life is my car or my house or my children. And you can let that run Every attempt of satisfaction, we just sang it, right? Every attempt of satisfaction outside of Christ will steal your joy instead of providing you with joy. When true joy, true blessing, being a fortunate, happy, joy-filled Christian here is what Christ is saying, comes from a Christian hungering and thirsting after righteousness. A Christian that is hungering and thirsting after Christ himself, who is righteousness. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, and only then will they be satisfied. And just as a side note, that's an eternal satisfaction. If our joy and where we're finding fulfillment doesn't come from an eternal source, then it won't ever be eternal. Think about that. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So mercy is this act of showing compassion on someone. It is withholding deserved punishment. Being merciful is truly a Christian characteristic. And we just saw with, with Ron and Lisa, they, they showed how there's ways that at this church and, and through organizations, Christian organizations, that we are providing mercy. I mean, some of it is called mercy ministry. It's truly a Christian characteristic to be merciful. In Matthew 18, we get a glimpse of what that looks like. Uh, there's, a, there's a king and a servant, and the king, uh, or the servant owes a big debt to the king, a, a massive payment that he could probably never pay in his lifetime. And the king says, I'll forgive you of all of it. I'll forgive you of all of it. I will be merciful to you. You then go and show mercy. Well, that servant leaves, and he finds someone who owes him the equivalent of like not even a day's wage. And he says, you better pay me back or I'm going to throw you in jail. And people see that and they're like, dude, you just got forgiven all of your debt that you would have never paid off and you can't be merciful to this guy, right? And so he goes back to the king and the king throws him in jail. He's angry at that. The reward in being merciful is that we will receive mercy, but I think it's not so much that we're showing mercy that we would receive mercy necessarily, yet more so because we have already been shown and received great mercy. Out of compassion, God withheld a very warranted punishment on a very deserving people, and placed it on another, namely his son, Jesus Christ. And because of that mercy, we then are justified before a holy God. Because of this, we can joyfully show mercy. We desire to show mercy. For the greatest measure of mercy has first been shown to us at the cross. So, verse 7, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Purity of heart is what Christ in his teaching and his life is constantly getting at. He's more concerned about the heart than externally following rules, right? We can all do that pretty easily. We can put on a mask and, and follow rules and look like we enjoy them on the outside when we really don't, right? And at our heart, we're thinking, this is dumb, and this is stupid. Why does my boss have me doing that? This is, just, this is inefficient. We're always thinking of the company, right? That's inefficient. We would, that's a joke. You're not thinking of the company, right? Thinking of your own pleasure. As this sermon progresses, not my sermon, but this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, and, and what we see with every interaction Jesus has with the Pharisees, really is what he's when they're trying to get him, we see Jesus getting to the heart of the situation. Christ, again, is not mainly concerned with external rule following, but what we feel in our heart. Christ is concerned with the heart and the motivation behind something which displays either purity or pollution. 
Our heart can display purity or pollution when we really, truly do something with the right motivation or try to. So we are blessed when we have a pure heart, yet what we have to realize here is that the only way to getting a pure heart is to realize you don't have a pure heart. Uh, There's many scriptures that say, you know, the heart is deceitful above all things. You know, the common phrase nowadays to throw out is, trust your heart. Don't do that. (laughs) It's bad. It's going to lead you to bad places because you know what your heart wants? Whatever you're finding pleasure in at the moment. And likely it's not usually Jesus. It's usually something else. So don't trust your heart. So the, the finding purity in heart is realizing that you do not first have a pure heart and that you need someone to clean it and polish it and make it better and give you a new one. And that's what Christ promises for us. A heart that is not dependent on us keeping it pure, but a heart clothed with the purity of Christ that does not fade or fail. It is in that purity that we find, I think, the greatest reward out of the list here. Through a purity, through a pure heart, we shall see God. Now, I want you to think about, just for a moment, in your head, think about what you know of God, the God of the universe, by his word and, and through his creation, looking out, looking at your hand, just move your hand around and you can think, well, God made that. Think about who God is and then think about this reward one more time. You get to see him. I mean, think about the, the, the multiple times through scripture where people could see God but only through a veil, right? Moses had to turn his back. There's other people that couldn't see him. They were blinded by him. All these instances of where God shows up on the scene and it's not like, hey, shake your hand. How's it going, God? No, it's you're terrified and you're falling on the ground. But yet the reward here for those that have a pure heart is that they get to see him. As I walk down this list, again, I cannot find a greater reward than to behold the almighty, everlasting, beautiful, holy, magnificent, awesome God. That makes me happy. As a Christian, that makes me happy that this one day will be true of me and true of us, right? Psalm 24, 3 through 5 says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? Who is able to do that? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation, I think is that word. (laughs) That makes me happy. That makes Christians happy, filled with joy. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not appeared. So we're not how we're supposed to be. Most of us know that, right? Some of us are in some pain right now. We're not supposed to be in pain. We're going to be made new one day, and it's going to be great, and we can run and not grow weary. We are God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him. I'm sorry it's cut off, but it says, as he is. We shall see him as he is. The pure in heart get to see God as he is. And I know that's a hard concept to wrap our heads around, but it's amazing. If we can just ponder just a glimpse of who God is and what he's done, what he's doing, then seeing him will be a joyous occasion. Joyous occasion. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We've got to keep going here. Next one, number nine. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Christians, we should find joy in making peace, for it is Christ who has made peace for us. Colossians 1, 19 through 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Who would have known that God killing his son on the cross would make peace for all of us? I feel unworthy of that. I hope you do as well. But yet, out of love and compassion, this is what he's done. Romans 5, 1, the next verse on there. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. The only way to know peace is because Christ has made it known to us. The reward of peacemaking then, and the only way to then make peace, is by making Christ known. 
So what we get as the ultimate reward, the ultimate peace here, is that we get adopted in to God's family. We get called sons and daughters of the Most High God. This is not a family where we have to worry about whose house we travel to for the holidays. This is not a family where there is always some sort of drama. This is not a family where there is tension between members. We are adopted into the family of the Creator who offers us eternal and perfect peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. In verse 10, the last, the last two are kind of joint together. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Another blessing that we may feel should not be a blessing because there's nothing fun about persecution. Yet persecution will always be associated with the life of a Christian. And honestly, we really don't have a concept of that here in America. We just don't. Um, though I think time is coming when, when Christians will face persecution, more persecution. It is in persecution that we get a very small insight to the immense persecution of our Savior that our Savior suffered, how he was mocked, how he was reviled, how he was whipped and tortured, nailed to the cross, and he was never not righteous. Persecution for the sake of righteousness was perfected in Christ and then set as a precedent for his followers. And the beauty of this, and I know this is, again, another one, a hard one to wrap our heads around, but we can find a solidarity or a commonality with our Savior. Think about that. We have something in common with our Savior which should never be said about us, right? We can find commonality and solidarity with our Savior when we are persecuted for his name's sake. When we walk through the same fires that he did, we can find this commonality, this closeness, this drawing near to Jesus Christ. So here at the end, in his own words, Jesus talks about persecution, which we know 20 chapters later he is finding himself in the ultimate persecution of dying for us in our stead on the cross. He says, you are blessed because yours is the kingdom of heaven, because you share in my sufferings and you are doing this for the sake of righteousness. Find joy, be happy, because why? Your reward is great in heaven. We don't look for a great reward down here. Our reward is great in heaven. So what is persecution for a little while if eternity with our Savior, the ultimate reward where we get to see God, awaits us? So as we conclude here, what we see in the first three blessings, what we see in these first three attributes of a happy Christian is that we need God. We need Christ desperately. We are poor in spirit, we mourn over our sin, we are humble, recognizing our state before God. That need then pushes us to hunger and thirst after righteousness and finding satisfaction there, finding satisfaction in Christ who is righteousness, who is the righteous one. Satisfaction in Christ causes us to live like Christ. That looks like being merciful, being pure in heart, making peace, and living like Christ inevitably brings us to persecution like Christ received. So these blessings are markers of the Christian. So what we have to do, church, Christians, is look at this list and say, can I say these things of me? Can I look at this list and say, that's who I am as a Christian? Do I look at this list and first, is my heart evoked to joy rather than, do I have to do that? Is that where our hearts are are leaning towards? Do we find true happiness, true satisfaction in what Christ says, this is what you should look like as my follower? What we find in the Beatitudes is not a perfect Christian. No such thing. What we find in the Beatitudes is a joyful, happy, blessed, Christ-dependent Christian. So Baker Heights Baptists, this is who we need to be. This is what your family needs you to be. This is what our community needs us to be. Because if we adopt these principles, then we will start to look less like ourselves and look more like Christ. So memorize these, read over them, live them out. God will use these for his glory 
and your joy. So as the band comes up here, what I want to do as we end is I want to just end by praying through these blessings. I want to ask God to make us like this. This is what we need to be, right, Christians? This is what we want to be as followers of Christ because it is Christ who sets the precedent for all of this. So let me pray as we end here, and then we'll sing our final song. Father, just as you have opened your mouth on the mountain to teach these things, so now you have indirectly opened your mouth through your word. And as we look at these things, God, we ask, make us poor in spirit. Make us poor in spirit to realize our need for you. Make us a mournful Christian over our sin so that we can find comfort in your arms and your arms alone. Make us humble. Humble us, God, so that we can see that you are creator and we are creature and we live to serve you for our joy and your glory. God, make us hunger and thirst after righteousness, after your son. Let us go to him, the gentle and lowly one, for drink and for food. God, help us to be merciful, even when it's so difficult. With family members, with friends, help us to be merciful so that we then receive mercy and because of the mercy that we've already received. God, help us to be pure in heart. Clothe us, our hearts, with your purity so that our actions and our motives are for the right, the righteous motive. Help us to be peacemakers. Let us not get in the way of making peace. Let us live peaceably so that we can look like you in our actions. Help us to make peace just as you have made peace between us and God. Help us, Lord, when persecution arises to not fall, to not fail, but to stay steadfast in our faith in you, just as you have been persecuted for us. Lord, help us. For our reward is great in heaven, and our reward in heaven is ultimately you. God, bring us to that day. Sustain us and keep us by your grace. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand and sing. I rejoice that indeed God's grace is greater than my sin. Let's sing to that end. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt, yonder on Calvary's mount outpour, there blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is Whiter than snow you may be
pardon and cleanse within grace grace God's grace grace that is greater than all our sin Amen. Amen you may be seated just for a moment we should do this every week guys Here's a few announcements. Next Sunday is a Baptism Sunday, so um, if you need to be baptized, contact Pastor. Um, we're doing that next Sunday, the 30th. Um, after that, we have Operation Christmas Child Boxes, as you continue to see out in the foyer. That is coming to an end here soon, uh, so make sure that if you want to fill up more or you need more information about it, go see the back table out there so that we can get those sent out uh, next month. Um, uh, on the back table... In the back hallway, I have hung up two new sign-up sheets, if you will. Um, Galatians 2, 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Back there, you'll see a clipboard that says, Church Needs. And that's very vague, on purpose. If you have any type of need that you think that someone else can meet, we don't know unless we know about it, right? And so on the back there, there there's a church needs sign-up sheet. And so if there's something that you have, you don't have to put your name down. You can just put contact information. We want to help one another here. We want to bear one another's burdens. And then there's another one below that that says available if needed. So if you have something, uh, I know someone had come to us and said, we have a wheelchair, but we don't have, you know, use for it. Can someone at the church use it? Maybe you can write something like that down on that clipboard so that others can see that, um, and, and so that we can fulfill these, these verses here. And so that's new back there. Um, and then the last thing I have here is coming up the week of Thanksgiving, we have our annual Thankful Hearts giveaway. Um, and so we're starting to collect food for this. I sent out an email earlier, and I'll have a table. I'm sorry, I didn't have one today. I'll have a table in the foyer where we can start uh, putting that food. We helped, I think, around, I think it was over 50 different families last year just right here in this community. We only reach out to people within a mile or two radius of us. And so 50 different families, we were able to help give a turkey and um, a bunch of Thanksgiving supplies um, and also connect with them and share with them the gospel, which was you know, the aim for us doing it. And so we're doing that again this year. If you'd like to be involved, uh, more so you can, you can talk to me about that after the service. Uh, so I'll be sending more emails out. That's an online sign-up sheet, and you can sign up via that email. And then tomorrow is the fourth Monday of the month, I think. I hope. Yes, it is. And we will be going back to the rescue mission from 3 to 5. So if you'd like to help out with that, that's the Martinsburg Union Rescue Mission to help the homeless um, we're, we're going to be going back there tomorrow. So there's many ways to be hands and feet of Jesus. There's many ways to, dis, to show our blessed nature of, of Christianity, that we are blessed, joy-filled, happy Christians, and we want to serve God through those areas. So let me pray as we end here this morning. Father, we rejoice knowing that the grace you have poured out on us is greater than our sin. This grace is marvelous, it's matchless, it's infinite. Thank you that through our faith in Christ, this grace is given to us so freely. Because of this grace, you cause us to long to see your face, to see you, God. So God, make us a people that desires to know you and make you known. Give us bountiful opportunities for that this week. And keep us and sustain us with your mighty and steadfast hand for your glory and for our joy. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.